six guards run down the range. And they were down there working with her for a few minutes. Like you could hear them say like, sit down Sky, sit down Sky, speak to me, speak to me. And then you hear one of the guards say like, where did you get that bag to? The programs that are available and the help that is there, you, you need to be able to help yourself and, and do that on your own. And she needs supervision. I feel like she needs supervision. And if somebody needs constant supervision, they shouldn't be there. Another chilly one tonight. Frost advisories are in place across the island yet again, but temperatures will flirt with the 20 degree mark across parts of the region tomorrow. I'll let you know where coming up. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. Former inmates at the province's Correctional Center for Women in Clarenville are speaking out about the conditions inside the prison. It comes after two people died in a span of five weeks. RCMP say it appears that 27-year-old Sky Martin died after choking on her lunch. Just over a month later, on May the 26th, Samantha Piercy took her own life. Both deaths are currently under an independent investigation. Sabrina Hudson was serving time at the Correctional Center when Sky Martin died, and today she told us what she saw and heard. Monday, she boiled a full kettle of hot water, hauled up her shirt and hauled up her bra, and scald herself with the boiling hot water to get to go to the hospital. And then Tuesday, she took meds off the med cart, acting out, took someone else's medication. Wednesday and Thursday, she was just beating her head off the wall, just trying to go where she knew she could get the treatment she needed. She was supposed to be on suicide watch, which I don't understand why there wasn't someone watching her 24-7. Another former inmate is also speaking out about what it's like inside the Clarenville Women's Correctional Facility. Jennifer Pittman is telling us about her experiences and how things need to change to help others like Skye Martin who are dealing with mental health issues. Here now is Arianna Kelland has that story for Marystown. Jennifer Pittman is living a good life, one that is now full of family and freedom. Unfortunately, uh, I've kind of had a hard road with addiction and mental health issues, which led me to become incarcerated. But she says she wouldn't be here today if she didn't serve 16 months at the Women's Correctional Center in Clarenville. Clarenville saved my life. It really did. If I didn't go down there, I, I would hate to see where I was now. But she knows her experience isn't the same as the women that stayed in cells alongside her. One of those women was Skye Martin. People had to help her clean her own room. She wasn't allowed to run cleaning supplies. She wasn't allowed to eat with other people. She had to eat in her own room, which poses a problem because sometimes with the staff, like if they're busy, they can't keep an eye on her all the time and she needs supervision. The justice minister says staff are trained to deal with mentally ill inmates. As for any staffing concerns, Andrew Parsons says he hasn't been made aware. Two decades ago, there was probably nine at most inmates. I was there at one point when there was 39 women. Every single room was triple bunked, two girls in the bed and one on the floor. So, you know, staffing might not have changed in two decades, but the inmate load has changed. It's been said the majority of the prison population is racked with mental illness and addictions issues, something the new superintendent of prisons acknowledged earlier this year. We are faced daily with mental health challenges. But is the system equipped to deal with it? I think the, the judges and crime prosecutors and everything need to take into consideration, okay, this girl, you know, she seems to need some extra help or based on, you know, history, she, she does need extra help. Maybe being in there is not the good place for her. Jennifer Pittman is living out her freedom in her hometown of Marystown, far away from the jail that she says reformed her. As for the parents of those two women who died at that very same jail, they're left wondering why their children didn't have the same fate. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, Marystown. And thanks to Arianna for that. Now we'll take a look at some numbers behind that facility. Justice Minister Andrew Parsons recently told us that right now there are 22 women at the Correctional Center, which is actually below the prison's capacity of 26. Many people have been asking about staffing at the center. Parsons says the normal amount of officers on duty at any one time is four, three guards and a captain. That number has not changed in 20 years, but Parsons says he's not heard any complaints. Now we'll come back to this story in the second half of Here and Now. Sabrina Hudson tells us her story and what it was like inside the prison during Sky Martin's final days. 
Problems have plagued the spirit of Newfoundland since taking over the old Masonic Temple in downtown St. John's. Coming up in five minutes, we'll tell you why they say the government's to blame. The review of auto insurance rates in this province is underway to find out why drivers here pay premiums that are much higher than in many of the other provinces. Here now is Carolyn Stokes spoke with some people about how much they pay for auto insurance and she's standing by live now with more on this story. So Carolyn, what are people telling you? Well, Anthony, of course, no one likes to pay insurance, but what really sticks in people's craw is that we have the highest rate in all of Atlantic Canada. Drivers in Newfoundland and Labrador pay an average of $1,100 a year, while drivers in the rest of Atlantic Canada pay about uh, $800 a year. Now, we spoke with one woman several months ago who decided to get rid of her car altogether because her insurance premiums were just too high. Mary Beth Waldrum relies on her own two feet to get her where she's going. I walk everywhere, so yeah. <laughs> it's been that way for the past two years, ever since the burden of car insurance became too much. She was 25 years old when she got her license and at the time benefited from a discounted insurance rate through her job at Munn. She paid about $200 a month, but that was in 2014. In 2016, rates increased. It ended up being over $300 a month. Even working at Munn with a great paycheck and everything, it was still not affordable for me. So I started looking for other car insurance. <laughs> but she was in for a rude awakening. It was way worse. It was $500 a month to $700 a month. There was nothing cheaper than what I was getting at that time. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> she was told being a new adult driver meant she had to pay a premium on her premium. Most people when they get their license at first they get to go under their parents car so they're not paying a lot but it was kind of a sad thing to realize that you know if you want to get your license as an adult you have to pay these insane prices. So two years ago, she quit her job at Munn to start her own business and kissed her wheels goodbye. When I do want to go up to, I don't know, we'll go to the mall or go places I can't, or the days when I just want to go up to Signal Hill and, you know, those times I miss my car, but I, I don't regret it at all. It was a huge expense that used to stress me out. Not so much the car, but the insurance portion. And so I'm way more content not to have that on my shoulders every month, so. A weight off her shoulders, but for most, paying insurance is an inescapable reality. Now, I spoke with some of those people earlier today about how much they pay. Valerie, how much do you pay for insurance? Uh, right now, I think it's up towards $3,000. <gasps> That's for two vehicles. Two vehicles. Full coverage. It's a lot of money. It's like... It's money that can be well spent somewhere else, but you need to have insurance to be on the road. I think I pay for two vehicles around $350 a month. It's expensive for, for what you get, I think, especially since I never have a claim. So it's like every other bill, I guess. I don't like paying it, but it's a fact of life. Uh, mine is probably around $1,700 a year. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's not too bad. Uh, it's about $130 bi-weekly. Mm -hmm. And what uh, do you think of that expense? It's not too bad, I didn't think, uh, it's two vehicles and a house. With everything included with our car and our motorcycle, it's about 600 a month. Wow, that's a lot. It is, yeah. How painful is it for you to pay that? It's every painful, we're, we're shopping. <laughs> And shopping around for a better deal is about all anyone can do right now. There is a provincial review into rising insurance rates underway with the hope of leveling the playing field and bringing rates here more in line with the rest of Atlantic Canada. Debbie? Thanks very much, Carolyn. Well, the city of St. John's has shut down the Cochrane Pond family campground for safety reasons. The city says issues related to waste management, electrical deficiencies and septic systems led to the closure. It says the issues were identified at the end of last summer and have not been addressed in the off season. City inspectors say campers appear to be converted into full time dwellings. Staff and residents at the park say the sudden closure has taken them by surprise. I had hoped that, uh, you know, there would be a little, 
a little grandfathering or a little reprieve to give some time to to fix these issues because you know I mean it's, I assume there's nothing that can't be fixed but I you know I didn't know that it she operated this long like it I didn't know that it was stuff that was a serious that they had to have a, a immediate closure in the middle of the tourist season right that means we got to try and find some place now to put the camper all our belongings on such short notice like it's crazy. No one has any arrangements made. If you had to know ahead of time that something was coming, at least you'd have things lined up so that you could move. I, I don't know. I don't know where we're where we're gonna go or what we're gonna do because, like, a lot of our campers up here have already paid our fees for the they paid fees for the summer. But that plane might land near that lady. Now, just a moment ago, Carolyn Stokes told you about the high cost of insurance. Well, here's another story that drivers will want to pay attention to. New driving laws have taken effect. They're aimed at stopping excessive speeding, stunt driving, and street racing. There are also some changes to the move over law. Drivers must slow down to 30 kilometers an hour and move to the adjacent lane when an emergency vehicle is approaching. And if you choose to ignore these new rules of the road, well, your license could be suspended, your car impounded, or you could face a hefty fine. Courtney Lake disappeared exactly one year ago today, but her family isn't giving up. The 24-year-old mother went missing after getting into her ex-boyfriend's truck in Mount Pearl. Her case, ruled a homicide by police, is still under investigation. Lake's family is organizing a search for this Saturday west of Whitburn. Buses have been donated to help transport people to and from the area. Well, now to a story about a historic building in downtown St. John's. The Masonic Temple is home to a local theater group, the Spirit of Newfoundland. But since moving in a decade ago, they have been haunted by problems. Here now is Megan Kwan has the story. The Masonic Temple holds some of St. John's greatest secrets and mysteries. But legends of haunted halls can't protect the historic landmark. Not from Newfoundland's punishing weather and not from the city's demands. We had to rip out a number of walls. The city required us to expose them. They were concerned about secret passages and what the Masons are known for. We needed to get under the floors, under the platforms. And it's a shame because we, you know, we had to rip it up. The city also demands wider halls, three new exits, and eight women's washrooms. Until then, the third floor is off limits. The added expenses in restoration will cost at least a quarter of a million dollars. And Hicks says the city and Ottawa are of no help. But the province might be. Newfoundland and Labrador's Heritage Foundation can fund up to $150,000 of the costs. But a special assessment is required. We need to really understand what's going on with this building, what's causing some of the problems that, that need restoration work. Sphere flew in an Irish company because Canadian groups charged three times as much. The point is that you know, if we want to save our heritage, we've got to make it easy. You know, we happen to love this building. We love the beauty of it. But we're just a small little theatre company. Perhaps the luck of the Irish will help turn things around for Spirit and the Masonic Temple. The company has started a restoration project fund. People can donate in return for things like an original brick from the temple, circa 1890. Megan Kwan, CBC News, St. John's. Now, there is a part two to this story. Mm -hmm. You'll want to tune in tomorrow, and Megan will take you inside to show you just what kinds of secrets the Masonic Temple is hiding. World Oceans Day is coming up, and these kids are doing some hands-on learning. But not everything they find at the beach is so wonderful. That story is coming up. It's pretty cool, eh?
Welcome back. The concrete foundation is set and construction continues on the long-term care center at the future site of the new Cornerbrook Hospital. Premier Ball and several ministers toured the site today promising construction of the hospital portion to start in 2019. A new acute care facility has been talked about since 2007. Here now's Colleen Connors was at the site today. This field turned into a makeshift dog park over the past few years as people waited for any sign of construction. Today, there is a concrete foundation for the long-term care centre, slated to open in two years' time. Right now, they're uh, backfilling inside the foundation and outside. Um, they're putting in weeping tile for the perimeter drainage. And we've got a, a section of wall formed up ready to pour probably later this afternoon, if all goes well. The long-term care centre will open first, freeing up beds at the current Western Memorial Regional Hospital, with promises that the acute care hospital will be completed right next door by 2023. A request for proposals for the construction of that hospital was announced today. This site will be the home of the new Western Memorial Regional Hospital. You can count on that. There's quite a lot at stake at this site. Of course, the long-term care centre is finally being constructed and helping the ageing population of this West Coast city. But there's a lot at stake for Dwight Ball too, of course, with him facing an upcoming election in 2019, just around the time when construction of this hospital is supposed to begin. Well, yeah, it should start before the election, but it's not driven by the election. A crowd of Western Health staff and government officials, along with some residents, took in the announcement today, similar to an infrastructure update in central Newfoundland last week. The new hospital will have many of the same services as the current one, with a better cancer care program and radiation services. This is a government that takes action. We're just not here to make announcements. We're uh, updating the people of this area about the progress that we're making and as a very transparent way in doing so. And this is not about an announcement. We're seeing shovels in the ground here and work will continue. Steel beams will be delivered by the end of today. The long-term care structure will start to go up this week. All good optics as a Liberal convention is later this month and the next provincial election in October 2019. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Dozens of young students had a great time getting their hands dirty at Middle Cove Beach today in honor of World Oceans Day. They picked up a pile of trash, including lots and lots of plastic, but it wasn't all work. They also got up close with the sea creatures that benefit the most from this cleanup. Here now, Zach Gowdy was there. <laughs> So what kind of stuff did you find here on the beach today? I found like garbage bags, a like bunch granola of plastic, bar wrappers, water, water bottles, bottles, tissue paper. So today we have uh, kids from local, students from local schools. Right now on the beach is uh, Ron Colley, it's grade five, and it's World Oceans Day here at Middle Cove Beach. So the grade fives are really wonderful to work with because they love to get in and do the activities, but they also make the connection between the activity and the ocean and the science of it. So on the beach here today, we have the Ocean Science Center. The dive team uh, are down here getting live creatures and sort of bringing them up in front of the kids to see. And we have uh, a team from DFO also here doing uh, activity on marine debris because ocean's plastics is sort of the theme of this world's Oceans Day. How does it make you feel when you find garbage on a beautiful beach like this? Sad because, like, knowing that it affects fish because I swallow the plastic. It's important because if we don't do this, a lot of the garbage fish could eat it and then it could get caught in the organs and they can't eat, they can't breathe. Surprise you just how much plastic you found in a place like this? Yeah. yeah. It looks really clean, but then when you look around, you find a bunch of like no, trash around and then you're like, wow. What have you guys been teaching the kids about the oceans and classroom before you got to this day? Lots of discussions. Lots of discussions about awareness of the marine life and respect for them and the importance of keeping our oceans clean and caring for them like we do every other part of our world. It's just, it's amazing actually, right from when they start school, even sooner, they're aware of how important that is. So there are future generations. So, you know, teach them now, put it into practice and that's what we're here to do today.
Does it make you think differently about the kinds of things that you buy and shop for in your everyday life? Yeah, yeah. you should like buy reusable stuff. Like reusable bags, reusable water bottles, you like all that. Because... And less plastic stuff. I don't think that well, takeout places should use styrofoam because you really don't need it when you could just be using other stuff to put it in. When you eat like takeout and stuff, um, you don't have to have the like plastic stuff on top. We should make more reusable things and people should buy water bo like water bottles instead of the plastic ones. They should buy like metal ones or the reusable plastic ones. And they could do more things like this to teach kids like how they can te do ways to like prevent that. Because really, it's for, for our fault, and it's affecting us a lot, too. Nice tank, and uh, what great kids doing us all a big great. favor. Great. It's inspiring to see them uh, understanding what we're uh, faced with. Yeah. But it's sad at the same time, all that garbage True. and plastic. Anyway, thanks. I was told that it appeared that my extracurricular activities outweighed my dedication to radiology. The millennial challenge, here and now reported on how the province lost uh, Dr. Chris to Nicholas to the United States. A local media. personnel expert weighs in on hiring a generation that expects a work-life balance.
Welcome back. Uh, have you ever noticed, Debbie, how great Brian's hair always looks? Oh. Always. Oh. Yeah. Always. Thank you. Where's this going? <laughs> <laughs> Where it's going is back in time. I'm going to go into the uh, here and now time machine right oh, now. Good. Uh, as you know, Ryan is, is off to greener pastures <clears throat> in Nova Scotia in the very near future. He'll miss us. <laughs> Absolutely. Not after <laughs> this. Only greener because the spring is a little yeah. bit more. Yeah, the green screen's bigger. <laughs> but um, nice. we're going to go back to June uh, 9th, 2008. June 9th, that's right. Take a look at this. Oh, wow. Welcome back, everyone. Pretty cloudy day for most of the you province. Have not aged. Some oh, sure. right. Great too. Look at all that hair. Finally came out here on the Avalon late this afternoon. I like it a lot. So, Ryan. How are things shaping up? <laughs> well, well, not too bad, uh, Debbie. As we mentioned, uh, sunshine late this afternoon on the Avalon. And that we know there was a hair gel shortage after. Your, uh, <laughs> really not a bad day My across the province on for hair tomorrow. Hair. We'll get to that in a minute. First, here's what's going on right now across <laughs> oh, most of my. the province. You can see Goodness. Mount Pearl. Yeah. Nine degrees. Those and, graphics were state of the art, though, weren't they? Well, they <laughs> certainly were. Did you draw those yourself? Or? Radar. Now, this oh, system here, Ryan. there's actually a <laughs> The well, best part about this is you see no clicker in my hand, so when I started here, there was no WSI in here. All those graphics actually had to be FTP'd, if you know what that is, right. from Toronto just before the show started. And then I'd have to tell the control room in the back, let's look at the next graphic or let's roll yeah. the next graphic. It's funny, when your head goes near the ocean, it looks like there's an oil slick. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. Oh, my goodness. Thankfully, wow. that's not my dad's suit. I did splurge for a new suit just before I arrived here. Man, those graphics But are you still fantastic. had your rubber boots on underneath all of that, didn't you? Uh, uh, oh, my goodness. And there's Mr. Crow. And there's uh, my mom uh, faking a fake name and writing good, nice comments about me. Oh, man. Wow. Ten yeah. years ago, Ryan. Can you believe that? No, I cannot believe yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. A bit of fun. Yes. A bit of memories. Tomorrow's going to be a tough day for yes. sure. Uh, Tomorrow is gumbo day. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never let that one down as well. And if you don't know the gumbo story, we'll tell Stick it around. tomorrow for sure. Uh, thanks for that, guys. Uh, okay, let's uh, take a look. I think in that first week I was talking about frost advisories because it was a cool week for sure. I remember... Uh, and my wife especially remembers uh, early <laughs> June and our first June here uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but frost advisories are in effect uh, for tonight across uh, Newfoundland. Uh, so if you do have some frost sensitive plants, you're going to want to make sure you bundle those up. Current temperatures just seven in St. John's right now into the teens across uh, western uh, central Newfoundland. I still can't believe that hair. Uh, as we take a look at your sustained winds, uh, you can see winds are generally light tonight and that will set up uh, that area of high pressure. Uh, those light winds will set up the chance of seeing some frost uh, for a good portion of Newfoundland, especially in those low lying areas. Our next system is on its way in from the west and we will see those showers of, and periods of rain. In fact, western Labrador first by morning. Everywhere else is dry. Cloudy certainly over eastern Labrador. Temperatures again will be in those low uh, to mid single digits, low lying areas, dipping closer to the freezing mark with the potential for frost. We'll see those showers roll into western Newfoundland tomorrow afternoon. As far east, I think, as the Beaver Peninsula, Grand Falls, Windsor by about this time tomorrow, and we will see uh, that rain continuing to track in to Labrador through the evening as well. Mainly sunny skies for the eastern half of the island, but certainly that high cloud starting to build in uh, for the western half of the island. Those showers into the west, and as I said, late day, Bayvert, Humber Valley, and then eventually Grand Falls, Windsor towards Harbor Breton. Some showers over western parts of Labrador, increasing clouds in the east tomorrow. And as we take a look into your weekend forecast, well, unfortunately, Saturday looking a little on the soggy side. Far from a washout uh, across most of the region where I think we will see some breaks over central and west, but it's a pretty damp day here across the Avalon. Across Labrador, we're talking about a few wet flurries mixing in for places like Happy Valley Goose Bay, Cartwright and the north coast. Temperatures on the island will be in that 10 to 15 degree range. A brighter day for Sunday, certainly. That precip moves out. We will see some lingering shower chances in the 30% range for the north coast up towards the northern penin peninsula and across Labrador, some lingering wet flurries. But uh, from Cornerbrook to St. John's through Central, not a bad day overall for your Sunday. Certainly the better of the two days this weekend. We'll have your uh, long-range forecast walk you through next week. Coming up, Anthony.
issue and that's how CBC somehow heard about it and they reached out to me. I agreed to do the interview. It was a year ago this all happened. Well, Dr. Chris Nicholas and his wife Becky have taken to YouTube to explain the impact of a here and now story about them. We recently reported that Eastern Health pulled a job offer just months before Nicholas was supposed to start. The young doctor did not have to repay a $50,000 bursary that was supposed to keep him here. The couple moved to Buffalo, New York. Now, Nicholas says he was rejected because he wanted to delay his start in St. John's by a month because he wanted to pursue a helicopter pilot's license. As millennials, he and his wife represent a generation that is unwilling to put work ahead of absolutely everything. I wasn't dedicated, that I was selfish. That was ultimately the reason that was given to me on why my contract was canceled. It appears your extracurricular activities outweigh your dedication to your profession. I think that it's ridiculous to have the expectation that somebody picks a career and that's the only thing that they live for, that you can't have something else that you're passionate about outside of work. I mean, what makes a well-rounded person is, you know, you have your job, but then you have other interests as well. That's what makes you interesting. That's what makes you unique and valuable to patients, to your coworkers. Jess Chapman is in the business of advising bosses, and she says talented people like Dr. Nicholas present new challenges because they want more than just a successful career, they want a life. I'm often part of conversations where we discuss um, the professionalism or the dedication or the work ethic of different generations in the workplace, so it's a topic of mm -hmm. some interest. Now he contends that Eastern Health um, almost turned against him because he wanted to get a helicopter pilot's license, so this is a priority of his. Uh, is that a reasonable thing for an employer to do? So you could debate whether they turned against him. So Eastern Health haven't commented, so we no. don't know what drove their initial decisions. Let's say you're a baby boomer. So let's say you're born in the 1950s, and during that period as you grew up, you were told that to get ahead in life, you needed to compete for every opportunity and put in your hours and do your due diligence and say yes to the overtime. That for you signals dedication, right? So when somebody else comes along and has an opportunity and they don't show the same behavior, that can flag for you as maybe that person isn't dedicated. In the same vein, somebody who's a millennial wants more work-life balance. So for them, if there's something they love to do and they're passionate about, and they can't do it when they've started their job, it's perfectly reasonable for them to ask for that opportunity before they start work. What we have is a difference in perspective on what dedication looks like, and not enough conversation about resolving that difference before we made a decision. But at some point, doesn't the employer have to assess whether somebody's side passions actually affects their, their performance on the job? Y yes, they do. Um, but I wouldn't do that without having a conversation with the individual. So I don't know if that was done in this case. Um, but I could look at somebody else and make assumptions about their level of dedication because they don't behave the way I do. That doesn't mean I have an accurate assessment of their level of dedication. What kinds of hiring challenges do these people who want a life present? So we have to redefine a little bit our expectations of performance and we have to think about what do we actually need somebody to do in a job rather than how do we want them to show up. So if we're looking at performance and saying, you know, I'm expecting somebody to say yes to overtime every day, that might not be realistic. And that might not be realistic, not just for a millennial, but for somebody who has home responsibilities or children, etc. So we have to ask ourselves, is what's happening here materially affecting that person's ability to deliver for us or do I just not like it? And those are two very different questions because at some point you're going to have to hire a millennial who wants some flexibility. It'll be interesting to see that once the millennials are running the world if they're going to be as generous as they were hoping their employers would be. It will be interesting to see how they shape work for sure, the different generation. All right, Jess, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. That. Thanks. Bye. Serena Hudson was a friend of Sky Martin, the young woman who recently died at the Clarenville Correctional Center. Sabrina has a lot to say about her friend and about conditions in Clarenville. That's just ahead.
A woman who was an inmate at the Clarenville Correctional Center for Women the day Sky Martin died says she doesn't believe Sky choked to death on her food. Sabrina Hudson says she could hear the commotion from staff when Sky was found unconscious in her cell. And what she heard makes her believe something else was going on. Sabrina Hudson was at the Correctional Center serving time for breaches and assault. She was a friend of Skye inside and outside of prison. 27-year-old Skye Martin was dealing with mental health issues. She died in hospital April 21st after she was found unresponsive in her cell hours before. Police say she choked to death on her food. Five weeks later, another inmate at the facility died. Samantha Piercy was reported to have killed herself. The 28-year-old also had mental health issues. Sabrina, you knew Skye from the time she was a teenager. What kind of a person was she? Skye was an absolute amazing person to be around. She was so full of life, so energetic, just so happy. She called everybody girly girl or pretty girl. It was quite amazing to meet her, actually. But she changed, didn't she? She did. The last few years, she got right into the drugs and stuff. After she had her daughter, I guess she hit a rough spot in her life. And her mental health state, she shouldn't have been in the Carnival Jail. She had the mentality of, say, a 10-year-old. She, Yes, she was so full of life. Everybody loved her. but. Skye should have been sent to the Waterford Hospital to get the treatment that she needed. What was Skye like in the days leading up to her death? That whole week was intense for all of us inmates in there. Monday, she was crying out she wanted to go to the Waterford Hospital, but Dr. Craig, as always, denied. He's the psychiatrist? Yes. Mm -hmm. Monday, she boiled a full kettle hot with water, hauled up her shirt and hauled up her bra, and scald herself with the boiling hot water to get to go to the hospital. And then Tuesday, she took meds off the med cart, acting out, took someone else's medication. Wednesday and Thursday, she was just beating her head off the wall, just trying to go where she knew she could get the treatment she needed. And then Friday, I was in with a lieutenant and a CO trying to get my stuff ready to leave to go home on Tuesday. And quarter to two, when I came out from with lieutenant, the banging was still there, but it got fainter and fainter and fainter. And then you hear the six guards run down the range. And they were down there working with her for a few minutes. Like you could hear them say, like, sit down, Sky, sit down, Sky, speak to me, speak to me. And then you hear that one of the guards say, but they thought they guess they tried to say it quieter than what they did, but they said, Where did you get that bag to? I don't understand how she would have got a plastic bag either, but the girls even down in cell twenty and twenty one, they heard, Where did you get the bag to? And where was the bag? Apparently in her cell somewhere. And was was it in her mouth? Where, That's where what I'm it? guessing. It. She swallowed it. And it must have cut off, like circulated one of her windpipes saying she couldn't breathe. But this is all a guess on your part, isn't yes. it, Sabrina? But it's the conversation that you overheard that leads to that speculation? Yep. And then we heard the girls on the range. We heard her flatline twice going up the range. Like it was a very scary day. Like I've seen some bad stuff in my life. But this is stuck with me forever. I still have nightmares about this day. Officials have said they think she died by choking on her food. What do you think? We didn't have sandwiches that day. The day that she passed away, we did not have sandwiches that day. I can't remember exactly what it was we had for lunch, but it was no sandwich. Do you think she was trying to end her life? Or was she just trying to get attention? What do you she, think? Skye would never try to end her life. I know Skye personally, and I know Skye did not want to end her life. She got, got a beautiful nine-year-old little girl. And Skye, I think Skye was just doing it so she could try to get to the water for to get the help she needs. Because she knows all the guards out there are not equipped enough to deal with this kind of stuff. From your experience in being at the Correctional Center, what do you think of the training that the staff have there when it comes to mental health issues? Some of them are amazing, but some of them, they just don't know how to deal with it. They decide locking us in our cells is better than just trying to deal with it. Like yes, the, the guards that did go down to try to save her, they did an amazing job. They did bring her back until the paramedics came, but later that night she ended up passing away, God love her. When you look now at what has happened to Skye and a second inmate five weeks later. I feel so bad for both their families. How surprised 
are you to hear of uh, that suicide five weeks later? Honestly, I'm not surprised at all. Because we get treated like we're animals in there. Do you think Sky should be dead? She no. apparently was on suicide watch. Why couldn't that have prevented whatever happened? We were to told her? she was on suicide watch because she didn't get no utensils, no plastic stuff, no nothing. But I don't get why they weren't sitting down and watching her the whole time on the camera. They're supposed when suicide watch comes on, like she had nothing in her cell. She was supposed to be watched 24-7. And I, a lot of us girls don't think that she was. What kind of services do you and others who do time at the Correctional Center get when it comes to mental health issues? We only have Stella Burry really come in for, to do any counseling with us. That's trauma and addictions. We're supposed to have people come in to help us get ready for, to release us to the public. I, the both times that I was there, I never seen not one person come in and try to get me ready to go out. Um, there's supposed to be like AES and stuff, but there's nobody there to help you try to get out to get a job. So you think there's big room for improvement? Yes, big, big time. Some people may not be very sympathetic to those who end up at the Clarenville Center. Uh, you've broken the law, you're being punished for it. What do you want to say to them? What do you want to make them understand? Honestly, the only reason I got into the trouble that I got into it was because I was in an abusive relationship. It was either I do what my ex wanted me to do or I go and do what he wanted. So I didn't end up beat black and blue. I was beat for the last three and a half years and I'd love to be able to help people get out of these kind of relationships now too. That's something I want to look into doing because who better to help someone than who's lived the abuse. Thank you very much, Sabrina, and good luck. Thank you for having me and letting me get this out of it, Sky. Sky deserves to shine bright. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, not a bad day in St. John's, but is it going to last through the weekend? Ryan Snodden, minus his bucket of hair gel, has his forecast next.
It is time now to meet our young athlete of the day. This is Connor Parsons. He's seven years old from Mount Moriah. Connor likes to keep active all year round. He spends his winter months playing hockey and he plays softball in the summer. Congratulations, Connor. Keep up the great work. You're today's young athlete of the day. Hard to top the last one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's no topping that. <laughs> you have changed yeah, the hairstyle a little, a little, little bit. bit. A little bit. You have not changed though. I, I have must so. Say. I had that big bang and long hair. Bangs were in. <laughs> Apparently, Joe was in too. So, uh, uh, anyway, great to look back on memory lane, uh, down memory lane, and tomorrow will be an interesting day for sure. <laughs> I am going to be in on the St. John's morning show with uh, Fred Hutton from oh, good. 8 to 9 a.m. So, uh, if you're in the St. John's area, you can listen to that. Um, Go down, uh, have a few stories, so uh, I'm sure to tell. You do have a few stories. <laughs> Definitely. And a few weather stories to tell over the past 10 years as well. Uh, in terms of the weather story ro rolling through the weekend, we are looking at uh, some warming temperatures for St. John's. Just six degrees right now in those onshore winds. Uh, 14 in Corner Brook and... 18 in Fredericton. You can see where we are talking about temps into the 20s across the southern Ontario region, and we will be tapping in uh, to some of that, a uh, little more of that warmer air ahead of this system for tomorrow. Before it arrives, we're talking about 20 degree potential for central parts of Newfoundland, back towards the Humber Valley, looking pretty good there. Even St. John's mid even high teens inland areas of eastern parts of Newfoundland. That area of high pressure again will have skies a little clear tonight, a lot clear tonight and with the light winds, clear skies, we are watching for the potential of some frost once again. So frost sensitive plants do bundle them up if you have a brave to put them out already. Friday morning, rain into Labrador City. It moves into Happy Valley Goose Bay into the afternoon. For the West Coast, we are talking about that rain into the afternoon. Friday evening into Central, St. John's and the Avalon will likely stay dry until the early morning hours of Saturday. And unfortunately, Saturday does look like a soggy one. We'll see some showers rolling through at times steady. Lingering showers central and western parts of Newfoundland, though drying out, it appears, for the southwest coast on Saturday. And we will see uh, some showers mixing to a few flurries as colder air wraps in on the other side of this system for you folks in Labrador. That will linger into Sunday as well. Chances of some uh, isolated showers from the northern peninsula down towards the north coast on Sunday. Everywhere else is looking pretty quiet. Now, by Monday afternoon, watch your timeline here. We're picking things up Monday afternoon. Our next system will be diving in from the northwest. Potential once again for a few wet flurries in Labrador City Monday morning. Uh, I think it will then change to some rain. Then the potential once again for a bit of a wet snow on the back side of that system Monday night into Tuesday. The timing appears to be uh, set to roll in for through the day Tuesday west to east across the island. I think for the most part Tuesday looking dry for St. John's and the Avalon and then we will see some lingering showers carrying through Wednesday morning with a bit of a clear out into the afternoon and our next system will then roll in for the later part of Thursday into Friday. So the active pattern does look to continue right through next week. No long stretches with areas of high pressure uh, setting up. Now you can see where Sunday not looking too bad, as I said. Monday still dry. That next system will roll in through Tuesday. Wednesday lingering showers, but a cool down in behind that one as well. So the roller coaster ride. And you can see where the normal temperatures on the left hand side of your screen. We're certainly uh, riding a little cooler than average over the next seven days. Should be closer to 15 in St. John's, 18 this time of year in Central. For Labrador, should be closer to 15 and 16 Lab West to Happy Valley Goose Bay, nowhere near there. Talking about highs that are uh, much cooler than average right through the next seven days with flurry chances too. That's your forecast to now. Your picture still to come, Debbie. Thank you, Ryan. Now to Ontario, where voters headed to the polls today. Liberal leader Kathleen Wynne has already said she expects to lose. She's been premier for over five years. Progressive conservative leader Doug Ford and new Democratic leader Andrea Horvath are in a tight race. The day hasn't been entirely smooth for voters. Workers at some polling stations had problems with the electronic ballot terminals, which caused voting delays. Some ridings will remain open late to accommodate voters, and results aren't expected until as late as 1 a.m. Some shocking images now from Nova Scotia. A raging fire ripped through a historic lodge overnight on Cape Breton Island. 
The fire broke out at the Inverary Resort in Bedeck at just after 2 o'clock in the morning, and it took fire crews several hours to get the flames under control. Pretty intense. No reports of injuries, though. The main lodge contained a dining room, a kitchen as well, and a reception area. All of that destroyed. Now, there are cabins and other guest accommodations on the resort's grounds that this fire, incredibly, didn't reach. picture of the day is a gorgeous shot. The colors are fantastic. This comes to us from Western Newfoundland and I'll even give you uh, a, a better clue. This is in the Gross Morn area, not the, the National Park per se, but very, very close to it. You're not making them easier <laughs> when you're leaving. <laughs> we'll reveal the answer. All right, we're going to show you a very interesting way to travel. While on a shoot earlier today in Middle Cove, our CBC crew met up with two German tourists. They are world travelers who get around in their homemade camper van. Have a look. I built it up by myself. It was a normal nine passenger car. We ripped all the seats out uh, and built our small uh, home out of it. We saw the icebergs, moose, caribou, like wildlife is incredible, it, the scenery is incredible. Wow. Wow, awesome. indeed, what an adventure. Yeah, quite the vehicle there, <laughs> amazing. Now to this story, Saskatchewan ranchers come to the rescue of a bison calf stuck in a badger hole. Derek Schaefer says he was keeping an eye on a bison and its four-day-old calf last month because it was born early. 
One day he noticed the mother cow away from the herd and he decided to check things out and that's when he saw the young bison stuck in the hole. Yeah, how big are the badgers there? <laughs> Schaefer sprung into action but says he was concerned that uh, mama bison would get aggressive if he got uh, too near that little creature, poor thing. <laughs> Luckily it all ended well when the rancher managed to pull that calf out. None the worse for wear, it seems. Nope. Happy tail, too. <laughs> Aww. There he goes. <laughs> they grow their badgers yeah. bigger. Yeah, there, they do. for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, viewer picture of the day. Uh, West Coast, not right in Grossmore, but pretty much in uh, Grossmore. Okay. And uh, beautiful St. Paul's. So it's just north of uh, Western Brook Pond, okay. not as far north as Cowhead, just right in between there. And a super. What I believe is a sunset. Yeah, it looks like a sunset, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. And uh, this is from Saffron Bennett. Uh, spectacular St. Paul's. All these places I have to put on my list. That's of, right. Of places to travel to. Now, Anthony made a great uh, comment last night. Where are we going to get these pictures? But yeah. of course, so many of you send them to our here and now email account. Also, the CBC NL Facebook page is flooded with pics that are coming. just as gorgeous. So uh, those are great ways to continue to send next week. Right. Have a good night, you hockey fans. Of course, the cup could go tonight. Ooh. Yes. Big night. Anyway, I'd like to see Ovi get it. Uh, me too. Yeah. I think uh, the new guys on the block, they have another season ahead of That's them. That's right. <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> see you, everyone. Good night.